Excellent. All right. So welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Allison Singalani. I'm the Policy and Research Senior Associate at SV at Home. Uh, before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional ancestral territories of the First Nations peoples on which we're learning, working, and organizing today. Uh, we're committed to honoring and making visible the Indigenous people and nations that were intentionally displaced from their land, who remain here in the Bay Area and are a part of our communities. This is our second monthly policy in action event. In case you missed it, we rebranded our long running monthly event, formerly known as the Hack or Housing Action Coalition. We hope you like the new name as much as we do. So thanks for coming to our second uh, policy in action conversation. Uh, so this is a continuation of our monthly discussion based and action focused event at SV at Home. Uh, we typically have on the fourth Friday of every month. Uh, this event is meeting style by design, so in order to kind of have the feel of being in person as much as possible, uh, we do act, ask that if you're able to, we encourage you to leave your, your camera on. Um, we also encourage uh, lots of active listening. We encourage asking lots of questions in the Q&A. We will have a good time for Q&A at the end of our, our presentation today. Uh, for today's event, SV at Home has invited the Metropolitan Transportation Commission staff, also known as MTC, uh, and both local and regional partners to discuss the transit-oriented communities policy. Uh, now I'd like to introduce our moderator or MC for today's conversation, uh, Kenneth Rosales, Kenneth Javier Rosales, uh, is our um, our planning senior associate at SV at Home. He's been working collaboratively with the regional co coalition partners on the transit-oriented communities policy update since he started in January of this year. So I'll turn that over to you, Kenneth. Thanks, Allison. Uh, yeah, my, my name recently changed because I just got married not long ago. So um, <laughs> we're all just, we're all still getting used to it. Um, yeah, so I'm really excited about today's event, uh, uh, our speakers and how, you know, timely this discussion is for folks to get engaged. So. Uh, before we before we get started, I just want to share a few ground rules. Um, so we want to ensure that the conversations and relationships here today remain respectful and also productive. So please be kind and courteous to each other. We won't tolerate rude comments or personal attacks. Um, so instead, we do encourage asking questions and listening as we learn and engage with with uh, with one another. So please keep uh, comments and questions focused on the transit oriented communities policy uh, topic for today. Um, and sometimes the, the chat can get pretty, pretty lively. So um, if you find that it's distracting you from the content of today's discussion, uh, we encourage you to consider closing the chat temporarily. Um, so we'll first have Kara uh, Vucic with MTC present on the background content and adoption timeline of the draft uh, transit-oriented communities policy. Here on, I'll call it uh, the TOC policy because it's, <laughs> it's a mouthful. Um, and after Kara has set the stage of the sort of nuts and bolts of the TOC policy, we'll hand it over to Emil Leonio Atanasio, who will discuss the regional, reg regional coalition's thoughts on the current draft of the TOC policy and the coalition's shared vision to strengthen it. Um, and I believe David is going to share real quick a link to the, the coalition's guiding principles on the TOC policy in the chat. Uh, from there, um, Erika Pinto will discuss how the TOC policy is an opportunity to bring housing, transportation, and environmental justice to the Bay, and what the audience can do to make uh, an impact and, and also when. Um, and David will be sharing a co-written article from uh, Spur on the policy um, in the chat. So immediately after the presentation, I will, like Allison said, I will ask a few questions to our featured guests, um, and then we'll open it up to uh, an audience Q and A. So uh, you know, feel free to put your questions in the chat. We'll track them and we'll come back to you when the audience Q and A comes up. Um, so. Uh, before we begin uh, uh, the draft TOC policy presentation, I'd like to uh, share a bit about our um, featured presenter. Um, Kara Vucic uh, joined MTC as a principal planner in February 2020, um, but has been working as a transportation planner in the Bay Area since 2001. Uh, during that time, she has worked as a consultant um, and as a planner uh, at the City of 
Berkeley and uh, the Alameda County Transportation Commission. Um, so throughout her career, her, her work is focused on public transit, transit-oriented development, uh, transportation demand management, parking management, um, and bicycle and pedestrian planning. So now uh, I'll go ahead and turn it over to, to Kara. Thank you so much. And, and thank you so much for um, inviting me to uh, talk to you all about the transit-oriented communities policy today. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen, um, and I have a presentation for you all um, that I will go through. Um, and I'm going to focus on kind of the, the key highlights and components of the TOC policy. There's actually, it's a, it's a pretty long, detailed policy, um, and we can share with you the, the draft policy document, and I'll also talk about um, sort of what our next steps are for policy adoption um, and, and what some of those key dates and meetings are coming up. Um, and then I'm happy to um, answer any questions, uh, you know, when, when the time comes. All right, so first I wanna start with talking, you know, talking a little bit about what are transit-oriented communities. And so in the definitions section of the draft policy, we've defined several, several key terms, uh, and perhaps most important of those is the term transit-oriented communities. Um, and we've decided to, you know, focus on the title of this policy as transit-oriented communities as opposed to transit-oriented development, um, because we're trying to be more uh, comprehensive in terms of some of the elements that um, are needed to create complete communities um, around our uh, transit investments in the region. So there, as you can see on this slide, there are a number of really important elements that define what a sex successful transit-oriented community is. Um, but the TOC policy really focuses on some of the core elements of these, not all of them, but just a few of the core elements that align with Plan Bay Area 2050 implementation. And Plan Bay Area, I think, as, as many of you may know, um, is our uh, long-range transportation and land use plan for the region that was recently adopted um, last fall. And namely, those are to increase housing and job density near transit, to increase affordable housing near transit, um, and to support transit use through parking management and implementation of complete streets and multimodal access improvements. Um, this policy is a really important complement to the growth framework um, that is included in Plan Bay Area and actually um, is, is a key element of determining our regional housing needs allocation in the region. Um, and it's particularly related to our priority development area planning program. Um, and that program was created in 2008 as a way to really identify locations in the region, particularly locations near transit, um, that would really be most optimal for um, new job and housing growth. Um, so building, oops, sorry. <laughs> uh, so building on that a little bit more, just talking about a little bit more plan, about Plan Barrier um, 2050 implementation. Um, so Plan Barrier has 35 strategies that address housing, the economy, transportation, and the environment and really overall seek to create a barrier that is more affordable, connected, diverse, healthy, and vibrant over the next 30 years. Um, and again, the TOC policy is just one toolbox in all of the tools we have um, and are going to, going to need to use to implement Plan Bay Area 2050. Um, and again, it's focused on really kind of two key strategies from Plan Bay Area that you see on this slide. Um, strategy H3, which is to allow a greater mix of housing densities and types in growth geographies, again, particularly priority development areas and um, transit rich areas, um, and to allow greater commercial densities in those same, same locations. Um, both of these strategies were identified as high impact strategies for achieving the plan's greenhouse gas um, reduction targets. Um, so these are the goals that we've proposed for the TOC policy. Um, and uh, again, they really reinforce this connection to implementing these two key strategies from, from Plan Bay Area. Um, again, with the first one focused on, you know, concentrating new residential development and especially affordable housing um, around the half mile area um, around transit stops and stations. And again, that half mile area is typically used because for most folks, that's about a 10 minute walk. That represents about a 10 minute walk. Um, and research has shown that that's generally, um, you know, the distance that, that people are, are willing and, and works, you know, generally works to, to walk to access transit facilities. 
Um, but looking beyond just that, that half mile area for new, um, to locate new jobs and new housing, the policy also really seeks to improve access to stations beyond that half mile, because obviously we only have a certain amount of land that's within that half mile, and we want to also improve access um, for folks who live and work beyond that, that location. Um, and so the policy, so as you can see in goal number three, the focus is on really improving multimodal access beyond that half mile, particularly to our equity priority communities. Um, and then lastly, um, to continue, the last goal is, is to continue our uh, partnerships um, to implement equitable transit oriented communities throughout the region. So moving on to some to now sort of the, the details of the policy, um, where will the policy apply? Um, so what we propose is that it would apply to priority development areas or transit itch, rich areas in that half mile of station stops or terminals of existing or planned fixed guideway transit. And so this is, you know, getting into kind of a little bit of technical jargon, so I apologize for that, but fixed guideway transit is basically any kind of transit service that um, is on rails or sort of has uh, fixed stop stations that cannot be easily moved or rerouted. So for example, regular bus service would not be considered fixed guideway, but something like bus rapid transit um, is considered fixed guideway. And so you can see on the slide, we've got, uh, you know, essentially a list of what those transit services would be and some of the examples um, of the transit services that are considered fixed guideway in our region. All right, so moving on to the, the um, proposed policy requirements. Um, so the first requirement focuses on um, residential density, and this requirement really seeks to ensure that if new residential development is allowed on parcels near transit stations, that it is built at densities high enough to support planned barrier implementation. Again, the policy is focused on implementation of a strategy to really locate um, new uh, housing growth near transit, um, which is really important to achieving our greenhouse gas reduction targets. Um, so the density ranges that you see on this slide correspond to different levels of transit service, um, with tier one being the highest level of service. Um, we are, we've gotten a lot of feedback on how we've defined these tiers, and we are proposing some revisions for the final policy, um, including for the first tier, which would be more narrowly focused on just regional centers. So tier one would apply, for example, to the downtown San Francisco BART stations, um, the downtown Oakland BART stations, um, and downtown San Jose Diradon station. Um, and then um, the requirements then sort of um, are, are lower density requirements where lower levels of transit service are available. Again, these requirements are proposed as minimums. We would strongly encourage jurisdictions to have zoning that allows even higher densities than this, but what this policy is really trying to do is to ensure that jurisdictions are zoning for densities at least at or above the ranges that you see in this table. Um, just a quick note on, we've gotten a lot of questions on what allowable density means. And so let me just explain that really quickly. So many jurisdictions have a cap on density. And so they say that you can't build, let's say above 75 units an acre um, or above 60 units an acre. Um, or have other kind of restrictions that limit um, overall density. And so what this says is that if a jurisdiction has a, a limit on the density that's allowed, it has to be at or above what's specified in the TOC policy. Um, so the density requirement for new commercial office development, again, is structured very similarly. Um, so I won't spend too much time um, talking about that. Um, but again, the focus is on ensuring that if, if new commercial office development is built near transit, that it's built um, at higher densities, because we really want to see um, those jobs concentrated near transit um, to make them more accessible um, via transit. An important complement to the density requirements is parking management. Um, and so what you see on the slide is for the bullets listed on the top of the slide, um, above the table, would apply across all of the different transit tiers. So regardless of the amount of transit service that you have, all of those things would, would apply. So this includes eliminating minimum parking requirements, which means that parking can be built um, by a, a development project, but it can't be required um, by the jurisdiction. Um, it also specifies minimum bicycle, bicycle parking requirements, allows for unbundling and sharing of parking, um, and for adopting additional policies and programs to better manage existing on and off street parking resources. Um, and then what you see in the table are um, parking maximums um, for new residential and office development. Again, the focus of this is to ensure that we're 
using space for people and not for cars um, adjacent to our uh, fixed guideway transit stations. Um, so the next set of policies focus on affordable housing and anti-displacement. I mean, I realize that the descriptions on this slide are very brief and it's hard to get a sense of what these policies entail, but we do have a lot more detail on all of these um, in the policy document itself. Um, the way this requirement is structured is that it's a menu of options. We heard from a number of jurisdictions about a lot of concerns about having um, a lot of flexibility to accommodate different housing markets and circumstances that they have. Um, and so we set this up to say that a jurisdiction would have to adopt two or more policies from each of these categories. So two or more policies that address um, affordable housing production, two or more policies that address affordable housing preservation, and two or more policies um, that address uh, affordable housing protection. Um, and then in addition to affordable, you know, uh, concerns about displacement for um, residences, we also want to address potential for commercial displacement. Um, and so there's also a requirement that a jurisdiction would have to adopt one policy that addresses um, commercial protection and stabilization, um, which you see listed here. And again, these are there's further detail in these in the policy document itself. Um, and then the last requirement, again, focuses on going beyond that half mile to really look at how can we improve access for people who live and work, um, you know, who can't just walk to the transit stop or station. So this requirement would requ uh, require that jurisdictions adopt policies and guidelines that comply with MTC's complete streets policy, which also addresses things like um, uh, ADA access um, to prioritize implementation of active transportation plans and any relevant projects from community-based transportation plans um, to complete an access gap analysis which would really look at um, what is the current geographic area that can be accessed via 10 or 15 minute bike, bus, or walk, um, what gaps exist that might be filled um, through different improvement projects to then expand that geographic area that can be accessed. Um, and then lastly, to identify opportunities for um, mobility hub planning and implementation. All right, so moving on to policy implementation and the relationship to funding. Um, one of the things that we're going to be doing uh, after the policy is adopted um, is to issue uh, more detailed guidance on, on specifically what jurisdictions need to do um, in order to demonstrate that they've complied with the policy. Um, one of the other things that uh, we've also gotten requests for is for further guidance on affordable housing policies. Um, and because affordable housing cuts across a few different program areas with the region, um, we're working with um, our staff in the housing and local planning team at MTC ABAG, um, and we'll be developing um, much more specific guidance um, on the housing policies, including more information about, you know, which ones are most effective given um, different needs and circumstances that might exist um, at the local level. Um, and the first four to five years after policy adoption is really going to be focused on policy implementation. Um, and we plan to support this through regional funding um, with our One Bay Area grant program funds and regional early action program funds. Um, and recognizing that uh, planning and zoning changes and policy changes take time to implement. Um, we also think that this syncs well with what's happening on the housing element side. So I think probably most of you know that you know jurisdictions are currently working on updating their housing elements. Um, and that cities will have until 2026 to rezone and make policy changes in order to implement um, their newly adopted housing elements. And we think that this should allow jurisdictions to be able to sync with any other um, planning, zoning, and policy changes they may need to make to implement the TOC policy as well. Um, and hopefully the two are, are reinforcing and support each other. Um, so then after those first four to five years of initial implementation, that's when the policy requirements will essentially go into effect. <clears throat> And what that means is that we will then be conditioning some of our regional discretionary funding um, on compliance with the TOC policy. Um, and what this will mean is that the one barrier, some of the one barrier grant funds um, for this would be OBAG cycle four and beyond would be prioritized for priority development areas and transit rich areas that are subject to and comply with the TOC policy. Um, but they'll also will also still include those priority development areas that don't have fixed guideway transit that still only have bus service because we certainly do not want to um, in any way penalize those locations either. Um, so jurisdictions that don't comply with the TOC policy are still going to be eligible for some OBAG funds, but 
potentially not as much. And then lastly, um, for any future transit extension projects, so this would be like new transit service um, that doesn't currently exist, um, their regional, the, the regional discretionary funding for those projects would be subject to TOC policy compliance. And that concludes my presentation. Um, so the next steps in terms of uh, kind of engagement with this policy, we are bringing a draft final policy to our joint MTC planning and ABAG administrative committee for action. We're asking them to um, uh, recommend that the, the commission approve the policy. Um, that's gonna be happening at their July 8th meeting. Um, and the materials for that meeting will be posted on MTC's meetings website uh, on July 1st. Um, and then assuming that they do recommend that the commission approve the policy, um, that would happen at the commission's July 27th meeting. And that concludes my presentation. Thanks, Kara. Um, and just noting that uh, uh, Kara's contact information was on that slide. Um, you know, this pr presentation was really informative, um, but digestible despite <laughs> despite its complexity. Um, I know you. I know a lot of you may have some questions for Kara uh, later on, so please share them, uh, throw them in the chat, and we'll come back to them during the during the audience Q and A. Um, so now we're going to turn to our coalition members for their thoughts uh, on the on on the draft TOC policy and what um, and what you can do to make an impact. So um, first off, I'd like to present uh, Emil Leonio Atanasio and Erika Pinto. Um, uh, Emil, uh, he him is a program officer with the state and local policy team at Enterprise Community Partners is North California office, Northern California office, excuse me. In this role, uh, he works closely with stakeholders and partners to advance policy solutions related to the three Ps at the local, regional, and state level. Um, prior to Enterprise, he was uh, involved in the community stabilization initiatives with San Francisco plant with the San Francisco Planning Department, and um, Emil also has a, a background in foreclosure prevention and tenant tenant education. So, um, so yeah, Emil uh, holds a master of uh, city planning degree from UC Berkeley. Um, Erika she her is uh, Spurs San Jose planning policy manager. Uh, she supports and leads Spurs work in San Jose and on policy and advocacy in housing, transportation, planning, and parks and open spaces. Previously, she worked on uh, worked in uh, Los Angeles County Supervisor Hilda Solis's office, uh, covering planning and transportation for District 1, as well as supporting the supervisor in her role on the LA Metro um, Board of Directors. She began her career as a community organizer and has worked in developing and implementing uh, participatory grant making models to fund projects addressing public open space, food and security, and early childhood education. So Erika earned her uh, master's in urban and regional planning uh, degree from the UCLA Luskin School of Public Affairs. Um, so first off, we'll, um, we'll start with Emil. Thanks, Kenneth, um, and also thanks again for inviting us to today's panel. Um, Enterprise, along with Spur and Transform, we, we have been collaborating with regional partners and stakeholders um, over the past year who see the importance of the TOC policy for the future of the region. And as folks just saw from Paris' presentation, the TOC policy is really quite holistic and complex. And um, so it's been really great to be able to tap into the different expertise from different organizations in our coalition. And that really spans uh, between covering housing, transportation, and environmental justice. And also um, of particular importance as well is building a coalition that is engaged politically across the region. And um, we've, our coalition has been providing consistent feedback um, to MTC on the TOC policy, and this is guided by um, our shared guiding principles that I believe Tom um, shared earlier at the beginning of our meeting. Um, and really at the root of it, um, we're really just trying to advocate for a more equitable Bay Area as we continue to grow. and. Um, Plan Bay Area 2050, as Kara alluded to earlier, it has set a lot of those goals, but the TOC policy really is the first 
and significant chance to start making those goals into a reality. Um, and it's it's been great to see that a lot of our coalition's feedback have been incorporated into the current draft of the TOC policy. And again, we really appreciate Kara and other MTC staff for all the work they've done um, on the policy thus far and definitely their openness in engaging with us. And it's been over a year of that engagement. Um, so it's really exciting. Um, in terms of the current draft, um, yeah, it is exciting to see a really strong draft. However, I say that there's still more that we can do um, to further strengthen it um, as, as it applies to any policy. Um, and to really ensure that we're able to deliver on the goals um, for a more equitable development for the region, more affordable housing and more vibrant, less auto-oriented communities. Um, and I, I believe we'll touch on um, some of those ideas a bit later in greater depth. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, and we're really now in the phase of the TOC policy process where it's it's really a bit more of a political question as we try to get it passed. And ultimately it's up to the MTC commission to vote on the, po on the policy that they would like to see. And that's our task as community partners to engage these electeds on why we believe this policy is so important. Um, so there's the action and policy in action. Um, and then, yeah, what we think can make the policy effective and equitable. So um, turn it back to Kenneth. Thanks, Emil. Yeah, um, I think, you know, thank you for just providing kind of like setting the stage of like, you know, what the coalition has done. Um, like, uh, you know, how much impact they've, they've had on the current draft of the TOC policy. Um, and also just, uh, you know, just encouraging, you know, folks to get involved and, you know, yeah, we'll, we'll dive a little deeper later into the questions and, you know, you know, the TOC policy is very complex, as you can see. And, uh, you know, we want to uh, focus more on the questions um, that you may have and the questions that we've prepared for for our uh, featured guests um, so we could kind of go in more depth. So now I'm gonna actually turn it over to um, Erika. Um, uh, go ahead, uh, your turn, Erika. Thanks, Kenneth. And thank you, SV at Home, for inviting us to join this panel with our fellow advocates. Um, Spur believes in the power of good policy to make changes for a more sustainable, prosperous, and equitable Bay Area. And we have worked alongside Enterprise and Transform, as well as in partnership with other regional partners and stakeholders on this policy for the future of the region. We think that by building housing, jobs, and services near high quality transit, the Bay Area can accommodate new residents from all income levels and support access to opportunity and provide expanded freedom for people to get around without relying on a private car. MTC's updated TOC policy is an enormous opportunity to meet our goals um, for increased regional housing, sustainability, equity, and quality of life for all residents here in the Bay. Um, for example, the policy would align residential and commercial zoning targets uh, with the scale of housing and job growth that our region really needs um, to deliver for the transit rich areas or TRAs as they're laid out in Plan Bay area. Um, additionally, the policy requirements um, focus on uh, affordable housing production and preservation will go far to commit uh, jurisdictions to improving those affordable housing options um, in those transit rich areas. Um, and we would like to uh, really share that if you would like to make an impact on this critical policy as it's nearing um, it being in front of the, the commission again, you can reach out to MTC commissioners at any time about what you think are the most important elements about this policy. Um, as Kara mentioned, it will be um, considered um, in July next month. Um, and so there's still opportunities to continue weighing in on why this policy is so important to increase equity, housing, and jobs in the Bay Area. Uh, thanks, Erika. Um, so, uh, you know, thank you both, Amy and Erika. Thanks for kind of giving us, again, just that that broad overview of the coalition, a coalition's work on 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 influencing the draft UOC policy and just like what what you're pushing for and you know why it's important um, and you know when and how to engage and again we'll get 
you know deeper uh, into this in this next section. So this next section is uh, uh, the Q and A, the first part of our Q and A. We've uh, set up some questions for our featured guests, um, and um, you know I hope folks are pumped and ready to engage on this topic. Um, so um, let's see. I will first um, I will ask my first question. Um, and uh, I ask that each speaker take maybe just maybe just roughly over um, a minute to respond. And um, for this first question, that we'll have Kara respond first, um, and then we'll turn it over to Emil and then Erika. So uh, the first question is kind of like a two-part question. Um, so, uh, how did MTC staff come up with the housing-related policies and program requirements included in the draft TOC policy? And uh, was the status of uh, housing policy throughout the Bay Area jurisdictions incorporated into the into this draft TOC policy? Uh, Kara. Yeah, so um, we're very fortunate, and there's been uh, some really great research um, led by Karen Chapel and Anastasia Lakaitis Sedaris um, on uh, displacement and specifically um, the effectiveness of different anti-displacement strategies. Um, and so we relied very heavily <laughs> on that work. And also, um, again, I think as was mentioned, like our partners in terms of enterprise and, and their coalition in terms of providing feedback for us um, and, and, and their thoughts on, on some of the um, affordable housing policies as well. Um, and so that's really what's kind of formed the basis for um, our approach to this. Um, and then, uh, no, unfortunately, we, were, we did not do a comprehensive evaluation of, of current um, housing policies uh, that existed at the local level. Um, that was something that I think we did have, uh, did keep track of at the regional level at some point in time, um, and that we may be able to do again. Um, but yeah, it was, it was not, it didn't factor into the um, development of the TOC policy. Thanks, Kara. And just a reminder for folks, you know, if you have any questions, uh, we're going to go enter the into the second part of the Q&A for the audience um, after this first section with, um, you know, questions that we prepared. So feel free to drop your, drop your questions in the chat and we'll, um, we'll circle back um, and try to answer them all. Um, yeah, again, thanks, Kara. And, um, you know, just for, this is for Emil and Erika, um, I was just wondering, uh, you know, how has the coalition influenced the current draft policies, um, housing related requirements, just as a follow up to the answers that Kara just provided. Amy? Yeah, so um, very, very similar to what Kara noted. Um, the coalition also drew a lot from best practices. And again, what's great about having a whole coalition of different orgs and different perspectives involved in this is that we can tap into those different lenses and perspectives. So um, for example, one, one of the feedback we provided for the three P's menu was um, potentially including ministerial approval, for example, um, into the draft, um, looking at some examples in the state, um, particularly Sacramento, where that has um, really helps for development, um, lowered costs and cut down time in that area um, as one example. And another is um, elevating that it would be great for jurisdictions to have a dedicated local source of funding for affor affordable housing production and or preservation. Um, if we do want to build inclusive transit oriented communities and build affordable housing um, in these transit rich areas, then it would just make it easier if there is just local dedicated funding in order to do that. Um, so those are just some few examples. Um, and again, um, SV at Home has been part of um, gathering those best practices and feedback as well. So just really wanna shout out the expertise of our coalition as well in terms of um, pulling those together, gathering the research and sharing those with MTC. Uh, thanks, Amy, I really appreciate that. And just, you know, just the following follow-up clarification question about, you know, local funding sources. And that what you're, you're saying like on top of like what, you know, OBAG would provide in 2026, local jurisdictions should really make a larger effort to have local funding to like, you know, finance gap to, 
to have gap, gap financing for affordable housing or is that what you're talking about just to just to kind of yeah precisely and i i believe that's um also how it's been written into the draft policy kara correct me if i'm wrong on that yeah, I'm trying to, I actually have to go back and check if we're, I think that certainly is the intention is not to say, you know, and some of this has come up in the context of the uh, recently created Barrier Housing Finance Authority, which is also, you know, hopefully going to be raising a whole lot of money um, for affordable housing throughout the region. But I think the intention was that there would be a local uh, source of, um, a dedicated local source of funding for, for a lot of these efforts on top of whatever additional regional funds might be there. So thanks for clarifying that. And Erika, do you want, would you like to add anything about that question? And feel free to go into, you know, the other sections of the TOC policy too, because I know Spur focuses on so many different things, so. Yeah, I mean, to, to add on to what Emil was saying, I think uh, we really have been able to tap into the strength of our coalition in terms of um, deriving from those best practices best practices um, in housing policy related um, strategies that we could use. I think um, the inclusion of some, you know, um, options in the affordable housing or anti-displacement categories for um, opportunity to purchase are, are very, um, you know, very useful and would be very impactful. Although we've seen that some jurisdictions have struggled to, um, to take that on, for example, in San Jose, um, they recently were looking at, you know, how to really um, study and 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 consider the opportunity of that policy to address affordable housing. And I think that that's what the TOC policy or what we would like to see is that um, MTC can use um, uh, the 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 policy to move the needle forward in terms of what can be used to to protect. Um, housing and preserve um, these kind of, you know, uses for the future and transit rich areas. Thanks, Erika. You know, and, you know, shout out to Somos Mayfair and all the different coalition partners that are pushing for COPA um, in San Jose. It's a really big effort that's been going on. And, um, you know, hopefully that goes in, uh, in the direction that we want. Um, and so I'm going to move on to the next question. <clears throat> we, about, we have about maybe five more minutes left and uh, this this Q and Q and A between us. Um, so question number two is, uh, we're going to start with Emil, uh, then Erika, and then Kara. Um, do you think the draft TOC policy goes far enough? Uh, if not, what specific requirements do you wish to see in the draft TOC policy that currently are not in there? Yeah, um, as as I alluded in in my opening. Um, yeah, I think we can always do more as a region, um, as we know. Um, we're dealing with multiple crises as a region and we are trying to address these and Plan Bay Area has set quite ambitious goals um, and we're trying to um, start implementing them through the TOC policy. Um, in terms of some of the priority um, aspects of the TOC policy that we would like to see um, some specific requirements. One is related to the three Ps. Um, we would like to see um, no net loss and right of return um, uh, ensconced as a baseline requirement, um, really to help um, mitigate any um, potential displacement. Um, and one thing about that is there's already state law that covers that, um, SB 330. Um, so we're hoping that it could be low hanging fruit and it's something that um, folks can adopt without a sunset date because state law currently has that set where it expires, um, I believe by uh, 2030. Um, that's one requirement and also um, in terms of the three Ps, um, further refining the menu. Um, we, we think it's been a really strong menu, but um, there's been some policies that have been added that made the list longer. And to some degree, you could say maybe have has the potential to dilute some of the impacts of those. So either requiring um, jurisdictions to adopt at least three policies um, or um, 
if there's a way to consolidate some of those policies just so we can really maintain consistency in terms of impact and scale. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there and turn it over to Erica. Thanks, Emil. Erica? Yes, thanks, Emil and, and Kenneth. Um, we think, uh, one, we believe that it could go further in uh, this policy could apply to all transit rich areas and not just, uh, or, you know, in, in PDAs, I, I, we think that that could go far um, to really support um, flexibility, um, but support um, development in the, tr in the true creation of um, transit oriented communities a lot where, um, where there is existing transit and the ones that are most supportive of those densities um, and connections. We also think uh, that um, the policy could go further to require development um, in all commercial sites and not you know, uh, in only office sites um, as it has been um, drafted. Um, it could create uh, some confusion or a sort of distorted maybe incentive uh, for jurisdictions to avoid parking and the density requirements of the TOC policy um, simply by prohibiting office uses and the policy can motivate some jurisdictions to specifically exclude these um, which would have the opposite impact of what the policy uh, is stating as its goals. Um, for existing non-office, low-density, auto-oriented commercial uses, the policy um, sort of, you know, could go farther, um, prompt higher density um, commercial zoning that would encourage um, redevelopment. So we are, we would be in support um, of you know, proposing that the density and parking standards apply to all commercially zoned land. Um, and this is what could go farther to support um, the stated goals. Thanks, Annika. And, you know, Kara, feel free to answer the question, you know, from a staff perspective, or, you know, just, you know, you could just kind of talk about like your experiences balancing, you know, everyone's different input, you know, from the coalition partners, from the public, elected officials, yeah. Yeah, no, and I think, you know, this is all really great feedback. And I think, you know, the, the challenge um, that we have in this region is that it's it's obviously a very big region, very diverse region. And, you know, ultimately we have to, um, a staff, we have to follow the direction of our commissioners. And um, there's, there's kind of a range <laughs> uh, in terms of our commissioners, in terms of their uh, you know, how far they think the policy should go and uh, or or the ways in which it should be constrained. And so, um, you know, we, we've tried to strike uh, the best balance that, that we we think we can at this point in time. Um, I will say, you know, we do recognize that um, this is a big first first step in many ways. Um, and we recognize that we, we I'm sure, are not going to get many things right <laughs> with this first version of the policy, which was why we've also included in the policy that we're going to go back and revisit it and potentially update it every four years, um, recognizing that, you know, hopefully we'll have a lot to learn um, after implementation and want to have the opportunity to go back and make adjustments um, much sooner, um, you know, along along the way. Um, so, uh which I think is, is going to be a good thing as well. So, Thanks, Kara. I appreciate that. Uh, we're going to have to move to um, the audience Q&A section now. Um, we, uh, we have maybe another question if there's time later, um, you know, that we had prepared, but um, if we don't have time, maybe we can stay on real quick after, every, you know, everyone leaves, we could just record, um, you know, the answer to that question if possible. If you could stay on just a little longer, that'd be awesome. Um, so yeah, so now we're gonna open it up to um, audience Q&A. Um, so feel free to, uh, you know, drop your questions in the chat. And I'm gonna start off with some of the questions that folks has, have asked already in the chat. So, um, you know, um, so uh, first is, uh, can affordable housing unbundle parking um, is the question. Uh, Kara, would you like to 
try to answer that? Yeah, I, I've heard um, in cases that this may not be possible, depending on some of the sources of, of funding that are used for affordable housing projects. And so that's why we didn't include it as like a hard requirement. The jurisdiction just needs to allow it. Um, and recognizing that in some cases, you know, it may not be allowed, but it uh, just to, to generally um, allow it as something that, that could be done. Right. Thank you. Um, and uh, Emil or Erika, if you want to talk a little bit about um, that answer or anything anything further about affordable housing and, and bubble parking. Emil? Yeah, I guess um, one thing I'll just try to elevate is um, in terms of uh, funding sources that Kara alluded to, the state really is trying to make a concerted effort in terms of um, really focusing affordable housing development to be transit oriented. So one example of that is um, the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Program, which really focuses on developing transit oriented affordable housing projects throughout the state. And it's now in, I believe, its sixth um, or seventh iteration now. Um, so that that's something that I would encourage folks to um, to um, look into and engage on, um, and um, it's 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 provided some catalytic transit-oriented um, developments throughout the state as well, not just in the Bay. Um, so I think that's also a model that folks could look into. Thanks, Emil, Erika. Yes, I think in terms of you know affordable housing and, and unbundled parking. Um, I think so in, in, in San Jose too, they just recently approved to move forward to eliminate their parking minimum mandatory requirements. Um, and they will be coming back in the fall with an updated ordinance that also revises the transportation demand management uh, measures and enforcement that they will be using. And they are considering, you know, unbundling parking as um, a measure or a tool that um, developers can um, can you know consider um, and I think um, I see the concern that this might not be allowed um, because it would charge additional fees but I in terms of like new development I think it really in terms of uh, removing parking minimums it's 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 a game changer in terms of moving um, um, housing in transit rich areas to not have to provide as much parking and really use other transportation demand management um, tools for people to, to get around and not have to pay for parking, you know, in the construction um, and then afterward too. And thanks, Erika. We're gonna stick with you and then go uh, the other way around. Um, sure. um, so what are your thoughts on developers providing smart passes at transit oriented properties? Uh, I think that sort of ties into um, the, the, you know, my, my response just now, I think um, there are, and I've been checking the, the chat too, and I think there, the, the use of it is debated or whether or not it's, it's, um, it, it, it moves the needle uh, for folks. Some, some, you know, I noted that a developer said that they don't wanna provide smart passes because their residents already use it. Um, however, there are so many other options in terms of providing um, transportation demand management tools that could meet those those goals um, in TOCs. So, um, yeah, I'll just leave it. Sorry, there. Emil, any response to that? Yeah, I can. I can only speak more on the affordable housing development side, and I, I will. Um, refer back to um, the Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Program. I believe part of their program requirements, or at least a lot of projects do implement it, is that they require um, that developers provide transit passes to residents um, for at least a few years. Um, so at least for some affordable housing developments that's already in place. Um, and again, this is um, aligns well with the state's um, goal and vision as well of reducing GHG emissions as well. And it's really 
it's really helped um, kind of switch the landscape and orientation in some communities in California, especially in the Bay. And I'm happy to drop um, a resource in the chat. Um, I dropped here the um, Affordable Housing and Sustainable Communities Report that Enterprise put together with California Housing Partnership um, that really focuses more on the transit-oriented um, community orientation of this program. Thanks, Emil. And Karen, do you have any thoughts on the questions about developers providing smart passes at, or transit-oriented properties? Yeah, I mean, generally, uh, you know, it's it, it can be an effective tool um, in terms of, um, you know, really, especially at the point of move-in where people are kind of rethinking their mobility options and how they get around, it can be a really good intervention um, in terms of helping people be like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to go try out transit and see if that that works for me. Um, I think some of the challenges that I've heard um, in terms of being able to do that long term is that it can add to operating costs. And there's not always, especially on the affordable housing side, there's not always good sources of funding to sustain those operating costs. And so I've heard, you know, that that can sometimes be a challenge. Um, I will also add that there are other regional initiatives underway um, that are addressing some of this aspect. You know, I think some of you probably have heard of the Clipper Start program, which is looking at um, means-based fares um, for um, low-income um, residents um, and individuals, um, and also looking at expanding that program um, to affordable housing developments. Right now, it's currently a pilot, but it's it's something that you know we've recognized at the regional level that's important and. Um, are taking a look at through through other programs. Thanks, Karen. We got another question here. How can the TOC developments include deeper levels of affordability, including for people with disabilities? Yeah, that's that's a really important point. Um, and you know, right now, I would say that the TOC policy itself does not directly address that issue. I think that is something um, that we would like to focus on or bring up when we get to the point where we're, we're uh, doing further guidance, particularly on affordable housing and affordable housing near transit and the importance of um, really serving people with disabilities in those locations, again, because um, those are folks who are gonna, you know, are likely to be more transit reliant. Um, yeah, I don't have a great answer other than, you know, again, hopefully we have new sources of funding coming through the Bay Area Housing Finance Authority and that's potentially something that we can use to really identify, you know, where those um, really important priorities are to some extent. But, but yeah, I don't, I don't have a great answer for you. That's all right. Thanks, Kara. Emil, you want to uh, talk a little bit more about that, and then we'll go with Tanika and close the, the questions. Yeah, um, echoing what Kara said about. Um, the implementation and guidelines process. This is something that we definitely could parse out a bit more and I would encourage folks um, if they have capacity to engage in that and provide um, those uh, perspectives and especially if you have lived experience. Um, I think one thing I'll note on this it, in terms of, um, it, it is an issue of funding and I think that's where, for example, one of the policy menu items of having a dedicated source of funding comes in. Um, and really it's up to the jurisdictions to prioritize um, within those uh, policy menus, which one is most appropriate for their jurisdictions. Um, so I would also encourage folks um, to uh, really urge their jurisdictions and voice your priorities and concerns and see which ones um, your cities could adopt. Um, and again, also elevating the really significant role that BAFA um, could play um, in this um, with deeper levels of affordability. Really, it is an issue of funding, um, especially um, it does create, um, it does require um, a larger set of subsidies and yeah, it's also a matter of how we prioritize our existing resources towards that. Thanks, Emma. We're running out of time. Erica, you want to provide some last thoughts, lightning kind of uh, thoughts? Yeah, I think Emil and, and, and Cara uh, covered it. Um, I think it's also an opportunity to really, um, you know, advocate for, for you know, 
these levels of affordability and including, um, you know, what plant more planning for people with disabilities in the housing element process that's coming up. Um, I know some places have already drafted, you know, their um, their first housing element. San Jose has not, and there are others that haven't. So I think there's still many opportunities to continue to um, have these discussions and provide other policy options. Thanks, Erica. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm about to, you know, we're about to close out and get like, because we're going to get polls and, you know, have, to have a membership pitch and stuff like that. But um, maybe after we do that, maybe you could stay on for a little bit longer just so we answer some questions and, you know, it's in there for the record the recording. So, uh, but, you know, just, you know, just want to thank um, all of you for, you know, such a lively discussion, very informative, you know, we're putting up uh, the slide for the next steps um, towards the adoption of the TOC policy up on the screen and also uh, uh, dropping email addresses of our speakers into the into the chat. Um, David's going to throw that in there. And in case you want to, uh, you know, in case you want to engage in this topic further, I'm also aware that many of us are working on housing elements and um, other planning documents where the TOC policy intersects. So I hope you can all get involved in the TOC policy update process and integrate it into the housing work that you, you're already doing uh, or in the work that, you know, wherever intersects you're doing. So uh, now I'm going to just hand it back to Allison to conclude the event. Awesome. Thanks so much, Kenneth. What a great conversation today. Thank you so much to all of our, our speakers. Uh, before we wrap up, there are a couple of items I just want to touch on. Uh, the first is that we have a brief uh, three question poll. I'm going to launch right here. We really appreciate your feedback to let us know how we're doing with our events. We want to make sure that our events are of, of value to our members uh, and add a lot to the conversation. So let us know how we did today. Um, and also want to remind everyone that we, SV at Home, is a membership organization. Uh, so at SV at Home, we believe everyone deserves a safe, stable home. Uh, if you do too, we invite you to join us as a member. When you join SV at Home, that allows us to leverage our resources, magnify our voices, and advance strategic collaborative solutions like the transit-oriented communities policy uh, to California's affordable housing crisis that meet our local and our regional needs. Your membership helps support our work, including events and activities like this one. As uh, so you can find the link to join us in the chat, David, if you could drop that link in there, that would be great. And together we can work toward bringing housing justice to the Bay Area. So thank you so much for joining us. If you're able to stick around and listen to a few more minutes of Q&A, that would be wonderful. Uh, if not, we will be sharing the recording afterwards. So feel free to catch it on the recording. The recording will also be posted on our website. So thanks so much. I'll turn it back over to Kenneth for last little bit here. Thanks, Allison, and thanks to all our featured guests for you know staying on to answer just a few more questions. Um, just that you know we feel they're they're pretty uh, they're pretty important to cover. So um, just going back to the first part of our questions, we had a question here: How do we know? Um, and we'll start with Eric, Erica. How how do we know that the funding uh, that the funding that MTC is offering is enough to get jurisdictions to comply with the policy? Is there anything else we can do to encourage compliance? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question, Kenneth. Uh, we do think that there are other, um, MTC doesn't have land use authority. Um, and so there are many ways in which, you know, it can't require cities to um, put more housing, jobs, and other, you know, anti-displacement policies near transit. Um, but, you know, funding is really that tool that can be used to um, conditionally get, uh, jurisdictions to to comply we think that there are other tools that the that mtc can can use such as endorsements um to um to bring jurisdictions to comply to uh and yeah i'll, I'll just leave it at that cool uh kara do you have any any thoughts on that question yeah i mean one of the things that we're going to be doing um after the policy is adopted is uh, trying to undertake a more comprehensive review to understand what the baseline is for most jurisdictions or the jurisdictions that will be subject to the policy. Um, and we think it's roughly about half the jurisdictions of the region are going to be uh, 
have conditions that that subject them to the policy, um, and and try to get a better understanding of exactly the types of um, planning, zoning, and other policy changes that that are going to be re required on a jurisdiction by jurisdiction level, in order to comply. Which hopefully will help us get get a better understanding of, you know, in terms of the resources that we have for planning and technical assistance. Is that going to be enough to really support uh, jurisdictions in doing what they need to do so that they can comply? Um, so yeah, unfortunately, we don't haven't been able to do all of that work yet, but it is one of our first to dos um, once the policy is adopted. And Emil, we'll uh, end that question with you. Yeah, just echoing what Erica said, um, I think it would be great if we can um include as many of as many funding sources that MTC has discretion over um just to really have that leverage but one thing um I'll note as well that really could encourage compliance is flagging for folks that the TOC policy really is complementary to many other goals that jurisdictions are trying to address um that are mandated by the state. So for example, um, just really highlighting um, affirmatively furthering fair housing. A lot of these transit rich areas are in high opportunity areas. So being into compliance um, could also address um, that requirement at the state level as well. And also um, regional housing needs allocation. We, we need we all need to do our part to build housing and meet our region's needs in terms of housing everyone at all income levels and the TOC policy is also an avenue for that. So um, really it, it, it could be an opportunity um, to really hit multiple goals with kind of this one policy. And I think that's something that I would like folks to think a bit more about and really the multiple co-benefits of being compliant to this policy could bring to your communities and the region as well. Thanks so much, uh, Emil. Thank you all. And just, I think I'll ask one last audience question. Um, I think that will, and this will just conclude it from here. Um, so uh, one of the audience members was, uh, was wondering if you had thoughts on the impact of higher densities on construction types that may cost higher and can price out certain unions. Um, I'll start with Kara, if that's okay. Yeah, this is it's a good question. And it's a little tricky to answer because I have seen, you know, densities and, and you know, I think this is a good question when it comes to regulating built form, um, whether you should use something like density or just kind of overall building envelopes or heights um, or something along that lines, because you can have, you know, I've seen projects that are at densities above 50 units an acre that are still using wood frame construction that haven't had to go to, um, you know, steel frame, for example. Um, and generally it is true, I think like higher density is, is more expensive. At the same time, we, we think that like we, and I will say caveat this by saying we have not done like a full financial analysis or financial feasibility analysis for, for all of these areas, but like generally speaking, um, the land values conveyed by greater transit accessibility, you know, should support higher intensity development. Um, and so it's it's not something, and, and at least for the jurisdictions that we've talked to about this, they haven't raised the, the, those density levels um, as, a, as being an issue or as being uh, potentially preventing development from happening. Um, yeah, and in terms of how that would translate, though, in terms of the the cost of the affordable side, like that, I I don't feel, you know, we haven't really kind of looked into that in in detail, so I can't really answer it. Thanks for providing, you know, whatever you you do know, Kara. Uh, <laughs> appreciate that, and I think it still provides a lot of insight than um, we had before. Um, I think we'll go to Erica, and then we'll close it off with Emil. Yeah, echoing what, what Kara was saying, I think that's a great question, but I also think it's, it's you know, um, I think higher densities near transit, you know, by and large seem to be supported because of the land value um, around these transit rich areas. And so um, I think that's a, 
you know, something more that the, that cities can study, but that the policies that are included or the options that are included in the, the, the TOC policy also support, you know, requiring um, that cities do not have minimum parking requirements if they're going to build here. I think that also um, supports, you know, the construction of these higher densities on, on, uh, on construction types near, near transit rich areas. So, um, it's it, yeah, it's pretty difficult to answer, but I think by and large the land value is there to support it. Thanks, and Emil. Yeah, I don't have much to add um, from what Kara and Erica um, had already mentioned. One thing I'll note is um, I think that's why we did make some recommendations that could help with. Um, with uh, addressing construction costs, like ministerial approval um, could have some impacts on that. But again, yeah, it is it is a pretty tricky um, question to answer. Um, what, what I'll, the last thing I'll say as well is that I think it's also interesting to see what happens at the state level because there are a lot of um, bills and actions that are uh, working to address um, those higher construction costs. Um, and we'll see how those manifest. Thanks, Emil. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, just to add on to this question, I think, you know, just uh, if, if, we are, if we are going to steal construction, we are going on to higher, um, higher densities, higher heights. It's really about trying to maximize as many you know as many units um into into those developments so that it can be more financially feasible right for um for developers to get you know get returns and um and you know i think the the things that we're pushing for you know like um you know parking maximums and and adding these things really can help lower the costs too as well while maximizing units so that's just kind of my my thoughts and inputs around it but i just want to thank you thank everyone um, here for for staying on eight minutes later, um, and uh, you know this is this is it. I'm going to conclude the show and uh, have everyone have a great weekend. Um, have a restful weekend. Stay safe. Um, be healthy, and uh, take care. Thanks. Thank you all so much. Thank you.